Thank you, Katie. Hi, and welcome to the National Ombudsman Reporting System NORS Table 3 Guide Training. My name is Amity Overall Lave. I believe most of you uh, know me by now. I'm the NORT Director, and you also know our other two speakers, Louise Ryan, Ombudsman Program Specialist for the Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, ACL, and Maria Green, NORT Consultant. As you've seen from the email, today's discussion is primarily about the North Table 3 guide that was developed to help you in your annual reporting through the new Older Americans Act performance system known as OAP. As mentioned in the email that we sent recently uh, as a, re a registration reminder, and then also I believe Zoom sent one out, it would be helpful to have the ACL Table 3 and the guide available while participating in today's dialogue. If you don't have them pulled up already, I will put those links in the chat box here shortly. Next slide, please. For today's agenda, we will have a few remarks right at the top from Louise Ryan, Ombudsman Specialist with ACL, some brief reminders about data management, planning, and data review, we had that webinar back in April, but I know that we have some new folks uh, to the State Ombudsman Network now, and it doesn't hurt to have a refresher right before we roll into reporting season. We'll also do a walkthrough of the uh, NORS Table 3 guide, provide some updates on data expectations regarding activities related to COVID-19. We will have time for questions and a couple slides with just reminders of available resources that you can refer to after this webinar. The slides, excuse me, the slides and recording from today's webinar will be included on our website and we will email out those links once they are up online. Next slide. I believe everyone is familiar with this platform by now um, since everything is virtual and in all aspects of life. But just in case you're not, you can ask questions using the chat box or the Q&A feature on your screen. Um, attendees will be muted throughout the presentations. Um, so when you have a question, don't hesitate. Just drop it in the chat box or put it in the Q&A icon. Uh, and you can see that by dragging your mouse to the bottom of your screen and enter your question. And we will address those uh, at the time in our agenda. So with that, I'd like to pass it to Louise um, for a few remarks to get us started. Uh, good day, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, you know, I'm really, um, this will sound kind of nerdy, but I'm really excited about this training and the guide that was developed by NORC um, because we've had these, a lot of these reporting requirements you've been doing for a long time, but we've never had really good instruction. So we finally do. So I'm really pleased with that. And I hope that you will find it helpful, and that's the whole point, of course, um, and that ultimately you have really solid reports, including your narratives and identifying what your program does with regards to systems advocacy and the outcomes. You know, it, the, the, you know, as you'll see and as you probably learned, there's a lot of structure to some of the narrative sections, and one of the great reasons for that is that um, in our new reporting system, the OAPS, Older Americans Act Performance System, we'll be able to pull those things out and like get an idea of what types of, say, systems advocacy strategies you use, what are the most common across the country, um, what are the least common. Um, so that will be helpful in future um, training in terms of shaping what ombudsman programs might need, where they're, where they're most comfortable, where's their best practices and successes. So this new format just allows for much easier data analysis. And so, um, you know, really looking forward to your first reports in January. And with that, I'm going to just turn it back over uh, to Amity and Maria so that we can get started with the training. And thank you again for joining. Thanks, Louise. This is very exciting. I know we've been talking about it for a very long time, so we're glad that everyone's here today. And uh, thank you for your assistance. 
and in uh, developing the guide. So to get the training started, we kind of want to see where folks are with the data management uh, process. So Katie, could you go ahead and launch the poll question and if you all could answer. The question is, have you created or reviewed and updated the state office data management plan since we had the data management uh, training webinar in April? And there's three options. Please choose one. And we'll give it a little bit of time because I see answers trickling in. Okay, Katie, I think we can close it out and show the results. Okay, I hope you can see those results on your screen. If you can't, just to let you know, we had about 22% uh, say that yes, they reviewed and updated their data management plan and 25, respond, uh, 25 respondents, about 78% said no they um, either did, did not create one or did not review and update theirs, but they did think about it. Okay, thank you, Katie. You can stop sharing those and go to the next slide. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maria so she can um, review some highlights about data management. Hi, everyone. I, you know, don't feel so bad about not having for the 78% who haven't reviewed the plan. I know we had the pandemic in between our last discussion about data, uh, data management and that has taken a lot of our attention. So I'm glad that we can cover just a few slides as a reminder for data, data management. It's never too late to start. So what you should do is review your office policies. Make sure that your office policies connect with your goal of having complete data, accurate data, consistent and timely data. Um, go back and review or create that plan if you haven't done so already. Meet with your IT staff or others who are helping you to review your data report so you can look for, regularly look for that accuracy, completeness, consistency and timeliness. It might help, and we made available a case review template so that you can share that with anyone who may be helping you do with the reviews, like supervisor, supervisors or other representatives. And then I always uh, encourage everyone to have some minimum baseline goals for specific outcomes, and you can certainly look at your data and make the comparisons there. The next uh, slide is the data management plan components that we discussed before, and you just heard me repeat them several times. It's always good to look for these four things, whether or not your data is complete, if it's accurate, if it's consistent, and is it submitted timely? Okay, and the next slide. It's a recommended process for helping you to plan for that collection of data, for the input of the data, monitoring the data for consistency, accuracy, and timeliness, improving upon that data plan. You know, that's kind of the goal of it. You learn from your lessons and then you improve. And then continuing the cycle once again with planning for data improvement. If you have any questions or updates about this, we've got all sorts of resources and Amity is going to share those with you on the next slide. Thanks, Maria. So just as a reminder, you've probably seen all this before, but I know we have some new folks on board. Uh, these are the links to the data management webinar we did in April, as well as the data management guide. So you can go directly to those as a refresher if you didn't get to participate in April, or if you'd like to look at that and start reworking your data management plan from here on forward. Thanks, Maria. 
Okay, so next I want to go to the next slide, and we do have time, a little bit of time, for some questions about data management, if you have any before we get into the OAPS part of our presentation today. And again, just enter any of those questions into the chat box or the Q&A. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions now, and if something comes up regarding data management as we work through the webinar, you can, of course, ask that question at the end of the webinar as well. And then we are available for programmatic technical assistance. So as you start really looking at your plan or developing a plan, we'd be happy to answer any of those questions one-on-one -on -one for you. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Katie. So the OAPS, as I referenced before, is the Older Americans Act Performance System. OAPS, as I'm sure you've heard by now, is replacing the Ombudsman Reporting Tool, referred to as the ORT. The state ombudsman or their designee will use OAPS to submit uh, your annual National Ombudsman Reporting System, or NORS, report. Um, on this slide, you can see a document that includes, it's very brief, just a one-page uh, that provides you with some highlights about what you need to know right now about OAPS and how to get additional information. So if you haven't reviewed that, it's just a really quick guide uh, that will point you in the right direction, at least get you started if you haven't already. Next slide, please. So if you haven't logged into the system yet, all OAP users must sign in to enter or view data and submit or create reports. After signing in, as you can see, this is just a screenshot. A blue navigation bar below the head delays navigation for OAPS. The uh, red circle, we just wanted to indicate the resource tab because it's an excellent place to get started to learn more about OAPS. The OAPS, as you may have noticed already, refers to the various Older Americans Act programs by their title in the Act. So the Ombudsman program is referred to as Title VII. The resources for Title VII include a Title VII user guide. And just so you know, that is a user guide for the system of OAPS. So that is different than the user guide that we're reviewing today that we created. Ours is about the programmatic side. So how do you enter your data, write your narratives, et cetera. There's also seven quick reference guides on that webpage. And then if you go a little further down, uh, there's reported training. There's three separate recorded webinars that are excellent, and the reference guides, reference guides are extremely helpful. Um, we, uh, there was a lot of positive feedback from the piloting of the system and all the materials. So we'll share how to get additional technical assistance for the OAP system in just a moment. So Katie, um, if we want to move to the next poll question. We'd like to get an idea of where you all are with the new OAP system. So the question is, do you have a user access to OAP? And if so, have you tried testing entries and uploading files? Uh, please choose one of the response. Either yes, you have access and have done some test entries and file uploads. Yes, you have access but have not done any test entries or file uploads. Or no, you do not have access yet. Okay, I think we can close that out. We have almost 70% responding and sharing the results. So as you can see, uh, yes, some, about 10% or four folks have access and started uh, testing entries and uploading files. About 17 people or 44% said they have access but haven't done any testing yet. And about 46% or 18 uh, attendees said they don't have access yet. Okay, we'll talk about getting access in just a moment. You can close that out, Katie, and go to the next slide. Thank you. So, to talk about uh, access to OAPS, if you don't have it already, reach out to Louise, and I'm sure Louise, you may have some questions about this for her later in the session, which is fine. Uh, contact Louise because there's a process that you need 
um, to get signed into in order to get into OAPS, and it's a part of ACL because ACL owns the system and it lives on the ACL website. So it's pretty complex. It's highlighted in the OAP highlight document that I referred to earlier if you want more details. For assistance for technical difficulties, so actually using the system, so testing um, and uploading data files, those kind of technical questions when you're in OAP, uh, that little blue box at the bottom where it's highlighted and says contact us, click on that link and it'll generate an email to the help desk. And they really encourage that you use that link because there's a form that they complete and it helps them in tracking uh, TA needs. And then again, for programmatic assistance for NORS and OAPS, you would contact us um, because we are focusing on how to enter data, how to code things, uh, narrative writing, those programmatic aspects of um, NORS and OAPS, not necessarily the system. So I hope that makes sense. Next slide. Some important dates, just to remind you, October is literally right around the corner. Um, and that is the time where kind of re official reporting season opens, for lack of a better word. So we really encourage you to get into OAPS, review the technical assistance resources and the recorded webinars if you haven't already, practice submitting your reports, start collecting your case and complaint data in the appropriate file format and so on. So you're prepared in January 2021 to submit the very first report which would be the federal fiscal year 2020 data into OAPS for the first time. So, Amity, I, I just wanted yeah, to sorry, go ahead. quickly say, sorry, it's uh, Louise here. Um, mm -hmm. For those 18 of you who said you didn't have access, that's probably correct for some of you and for others you may have access and are not aware. So I am kind of sifting through who's got what and um, you will be hearing from me if you don't have access. Um, um, and so I think I know who you are. So I will be sending out information to you to have you sign the rules of behavior form and then you will get the emails that come through ACL IT and something called Okta. So stay tuned. I will hope to get that out in the next couple of days. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Louise. So now let's get into the, to the meat of the presentation and talk about uh, the NORS Table 3 User Guide and then putting that first report into OAP. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maria to cover that content. Hi, so what you see on your screen in front of you on the left-hand side is just the front cover of the National Ombudsman Reporting System, NORS Table 3. And then on the right-hand side is the brand new Older Americans Act Performance System, or OAPS, submission guide. So those are the two things that are available to you. If you go into the chat box, you can see the link, download those. If you um, would prefer to have them open while we talk, if not, that's totally okay. I'm going to be referencing many of the resources that are in the guide, and then you can just go back and look through them, look at them closer after the session. Okay, next slide, please. So it, it may sound unusual, but we're going to do a little bit of referencing of the old reporting system, which is called ORT, Ombudsman Reporting Tool. It's been around for a long time. But I'm so glad that we've made the change to the new system, which is OAPS. So for those of you who are brand new to the system, um, hopefully available to you still somewhere in your office, someone can help you see the prior reports in the old ORT, because some of those, that information may be very helpful to you uh, in preparing your submissions in the OAPS. And then those of you who have had a lot of longe longevity in the program, it may be helpful to just kind of have a reminder of here's how we used to do it. Now here is how it's going to be a little bit different. Next slide. So just to back to that table three user guide, um, 
we're going to talk about both the data and the narratives that are needed to explain the work of the Ombudsman Program. As you think about it, you know, narratives help to make the data real because sometimes some people aren't as geared towards numbers and they need to hear that story. Or it's a nice combination to have them both to be able to do your advocacy, show the hard data, but then also tell a story that makes it real for people. Uh, we're going to be discussing a lot about the narratives, but we're going to highlight the other areas too. So let's go to the next slide and we'll just cover some of the general tips for writing those narratives. I find, and we think it's a lot easier if you first will draft your narratives in Word or some other similar document first. So while you're there, you can do all your edit checks, your spelling, you can count how many words are in your narrative. You can, in the new OAPs, you can um, have narratives as long as 500 words. So it, it is a lot of opportunity to give more descriptive information, give more examples and results than in the old system. We ask, however, that you be concise with your narratives. And please do not go back into your software system and just copy and paste these long case notes that we don't usually find those too helpful. Next slide. So, you know, Louise and all of her friends at ACL, they know all of the common uh, acronyms that we tend to use. You see some there on the slide. So you can use those acronyms. We just ask that when you're listing anything specific to your state, where we might not recognize those acronyms, if you would spell them out at least one time for us. We'd like for you to focus on identifying all your collaborators collaborating partners and their roles as it's appropriate in the discussion. And then think about it, when you choose your examples, think about the ones that have had a broader advocacy impact. Uh, maybe the ones that it was a complaint that rose to the level of needing legislative change. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's foremost in our minds right now. We ask you to think about those that are impacted, complaints that are impacted by COVID-19. In the next slide, we're going to talk about Part A. So things are, um, the, the, the way it's set up in OAPS, and, and this is similar to prior submissions, is you're asked to provide two complaint examples. One of them must be about a nursing facility example, and one must be about a residential care community. Then there's a third one that's optional, and so you can choose either to share a, an example about a nursing facility, a residential care community, or some other type of ombudsman service. New kind of since the pandemic has started is that we're asking that you consider having at least one of the two or three examples that you submit be about COVID. On the next slide, you're going to see an example that may look familiar, familiar to some, um, but we chose a very good example from a prior submission in the old system, and we kind of underlined there that you can see some of the things that were mentioned that made us want to know more about the story, like it was noted in the old Oratia narrative that there was an anonymous note. And there was a reference to the story triggering a larger conversation, but we were asked, we were left wondering, well, what, what's more? What is some more of the details? This was very brief and this was, you know, fine for the old ORT system. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that it kind of continued with the story a little bit discussing um, a little bit more detail about the story, but it was basically, you know, two paragraphs long. Um, I'm not going to take the time because we've got so much to cover today to talk about these specific examples, but I'll show you in the next slide, please, Katie. We're going to switch to looking at it as to how the same example might show in your OAP submission. So at the very beginning, you're asked to identify what type of facility. This one is about a nursing facility, or it occurs inside of a nursing home. And then the description. 
So you'll see um, underlined here, the notes were left on his bed when he and his roommate were out of the room. So this one resident had been receiving these very derogatory anonymous notes that were um, in reference to the LGBT. And so the prior submission had just said there were anonymous notes. We left a little bit more detail here that they were left on his bed when they were out of the room. Um, there's references to, you know, the who, what, where, and when. That's always helpful when you're going to just set the scene. You know, the who is the resident, and the representative then is talking with them. They bring in facility staff, the local law enforcement, and you'll see on the next slide, thank you, Katie, that um, this narrative goes a little bit further, sharing that the resident had told the representative that he was very upset. It triggered some past um, memories for him that were very painful and that he had been working with his therapist in counseling and that the resident then asked for the resident to help. And giving this little bit more information talks about the complexity of the complaint, gives the reader a little bit more idea of how complex the work of the Ombudsman program is. In the OAT system, as you see, there's the complaint category. There's gonna be a drop-down menu. You can choose the category, which for this one is abuse, gross neglect, and exploitation. And then there's a drop-down box also for the complaint code. And then there's a verification option. Next slide. This is actually um, the narrative of the resolution of the complaint or the disposition of the narrative. Uh, basically, the law enforcement officers were not able to identify who wrote the note. But it led, you remember on the ORT, it talked about it, had a larger conversation about it. Well, this gives more details about, okay, how did this larger conversation happen? The resident basically wanted to and agreed to work with the representative to find additional representative um, resources, excuse me, from all these great collaborative partners that you see listed here on the screen and underlined. Um, so the ombudsman reached out to all of these resources. If you go to the next page, you'll see that in working with the resident, they use these as guides and they worked with the facility staff. Basically, they created new um, resident handbook and information that was going to be very more opening and welcoming to people of um, in LGBT community who might live there or think about moving to this new community. Um, it also evolved that the, in this story, at least in this narrative, that the representative was asked by the facility staff to come do an in-service training. So think about it when you're telling your narratives of the follow through of the work. So this was a complaint narrative, but it ended up that the resident or the uh, representative, excuse me, was asked to come and do an in-service education about this. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see it even went a little bit further. When the representative actually talked to the state ombudsman, she suggested that they provide this training to all the representatives about LGBT older adults. And so the state ombudsman consulted with partners once again, you see listed here or suggested ones, and decided not only would they do this training, but they would incorporate it into their initial certification training. So very quickly, that was an example of like a complete telling the story. That, that in less than 500 words was able to explain what the complaint was about, that it had a broader impact, that it just didn't apply to just one resident, that it involved a lot of collaborative partners, and it involved a lot of training opportunities, not only a training with facility staff, but with ombudsman representatives, and you know, had a very good 
uh, conclusion and story to tell with this. Okay, so now we're going to transition. That was just one example of a complaint uh, narrative. When you go to your new OAPS guide, you're going to see that there's many examples of how you might submit something in OAP. So we're just showing one today. The next one is going to be describing the system's issues. Uh, you're going to have up to three priority long-term care services or support issues that you can submit into OAP. So if we get to the next slide. When you select your systems issue, they're going to be modeled after the complaint topics A through L. Or if you want, you can choose O for other option. And if you choose that other option, you're going to need to give us a brief description in the text box so we know what it's about. And when we ask for the status of the issue, we're referring to the reporting year um, and ask to, for you to identify if it's not fully resolved if it's an unresolved issue from prior FFY, federal fiscal year. Uh, and then you're going to choose your affected setting. So that would be a, a nursing home, a nursing facility, excuse me, residential care community, uh, or not specific to a setting. And if you're like trying to remember, okay, what are all of these Affected setting, what's the definition for that? That's when you go back to your NORS Table 3 and look for your definitions and examples there. So on the next slide, for the guidance for systems issues, the general tips are the same as the ones we talked about for complaint narratives. You're going to describe the problem, describe the barriers, and then the difference between the two. And I know this might not, writing may not come naturally to everyone. So I just implore you to remember the advice of teachers back when we were instructed to create an outline first. That might be helpful in helping you to draft the narrative. And you can list the problem or problems and all the barriers encountered in, encountered in working on the systems issue in that outline. Then that might help you to develop the story. Next slide. Oh, you know what? Let's go back one more, please, Katie. Go back to the prior slide, if possible. OK. OK, that's fine. Let's move to the back to the next one, moving forward. Uh, and then one more, Katie. Thank you. So I won't read this drop down box, but when you're entering it into OAPS, it's going to ask you to supply or to check off all the ones that apply to the narrative that you're submitting. Um, it's going to help both ACL and NORC learn more of the most common strategies that you use for working on systemic issues. And then you've got that opportunity, you see the option way down at the bottom, that if it's a resolution strategy that wasn't listed in the drop-down box, that you can write a brief description. Next slide. So you're going to describe the resolution strategies you use to address this issue. And you're going to describe all the details, such as collaborative efforts, your implementation of the statewide advocacy, involvement of the representatives, community education related to that issue, and then any other policy, regulatory, legislative, or other outcome as a result of your hard work. So in the next slide, we're going to show how the previous submission looked in the old um, ORT. So this example is about guardianship systems work. And in this state, the state ombudsman had worked with others in the state to um, apply for a WINGS grant, Working Interdisciplinary Networks of Guardianship Stakeholders grant. And it just briefly, in fact, this was like 96 words, described the work that had been done. On the next slide, we'll show you 
how we're asking or expect to see in the OAP submission a little bit more detail. So a while ago, I mentioned that you're going to choose from that drop-down box, right? And you're going to choose systems or other issues. This one was not a related to a facility, so we chose system and other issues. And then we just start describing the problem. Um, I put this plug in for the first sentence about after analyzing program complaint data, because I want to make the um, reference back to the importance of a regular review of your data, because often that is going to, you're going to discover that those are the things that you feel that will become advocacy issues or systems issues that you should deal with in your state. And so we actually put this into the, the description that you were looking for trends. And in this particular example, that the guardianships were very restrictive. In the next slide, you'll see what's underlined there. We went a little bit further in trying to describe the barriers. What are the challenges in this state? And in this particular state, uh, we no one should assume that all probate judges have been trained in law and are, um, have passed the bar, for instance. So in this example, uh, this state doesn't require their probate judges to have that legal background and training. And based on some of the complaints and uh, issues that were coming in to the state ombudsman office, it was clear that the probate judges would benefit from training. So we're identifying the the barriers, describing it a little bit, talking about all the different partners and others who are going to need to help the state ombudsman work on the resolution of this problem. Next slide. So it explains when, from the beginning, you know, it was decided as a state ombudsman, he couldn't address this himself. He needed to form a coalition to get others involved in helping with some resolution. So this describes all the various partners that helped make it possible and which entity pursued the grant, the WINGS grant, for example, and the work that they did behind us, behind the scenes to get the grant. And the next slide. This is an example of how to describe your barriers, for instance. Uh, just acknowledged, hey, we had a problem starting up the work group, but once we got going, we were fine. Then we just discovered that our first legislator who was going to work with us had health problems, had to decline working with us further, but then that uh, policymaker helped us find another legislator to sponsor the bill. So it gives us the background on the effort of everything that went into this to make this work possible. Next slide. This just references, once again, that in, that in the OAP system, you're going to have that opportunity with a drop-down menu to choose, you know, how um, it was resolved, not resolved, partially resolved, et cetera. And then in this particular example, it was not specific to a uh, setting. I love that the OAP system has these drop-down menus. You're going to really enjoy those options. And last but not least, we ask for all of your resolution strategies. You may certainly choose more than one as it's appropriate to the story that you just told. And then if one of your resolution strategies was not listed in that menu of options, then there's an opportunity for you to describe what that other resolution strategy was. <laughs> Next slide. So in the resolution description, the state ombudsman was able to report her work on the committee that she provided a written and oral testimony and that there were presentations done. And you can, when writing the narrative, you can go back and look at the resolution strategies drop down list and the ones that you chose. That kind of helps you frame out your narrative discussion. Next slide.
And it's always important to brag on your work of your program, you know, highlight all of those accomplishments. Focus on the good work that you did. You know, we did all this additional training to ombudsman staff and volunteers. Um, even tell us a little bit about what was involved in the training would be helpful to, to best understand all the work involved. It mentions also in this description, here's all the members of the group that worked with us. And here's what more work we've got to do. In other words, we started with the probate judges. Uh, there's a little bit more work there to do with them. We've developed literature that all the various members of WINGS is going to share with their constituents. And so it leaves the reader just really fully understanding all the good things that you've accomplished and who worked with you to accomplish those and what were the challenges, uh, the solutions, and the ultimate resolution. Okay, next slide. Now we're shifting gears, kind of moving away from those narrative examples to talking about Part C, organizational structure. So I want to share up front, you can see the smaller note down there at the bottom, and the old ORT, the organizational structure and the conflicts of interest information were kind of together. But with OAPs, they've been separated out. So Part C deals with organizational structure of both your state office and ombudsman local entities, if you have them. So we realize that many of you are centralized. You report under one office. Um, the other model is that you're decentralized and that you've got these contractors or local entities throughout the state. So you can reference back to the definition of centralized and decentralized and all of the, um, yeah, I was just checking my notes. That's going to be the best thing for you to look and back and see is that specific organizational structure and which one of those that you're going to choose then within OS. Okay, on the next slide. We're showing you an example. You can see that, well, exactly, we're showing you the drop down menu. So you would choose which one of these applies for your state ombudsman program. This is going to be really beneficial to ACL because they'll be able to look and see quickly uh, the lay of the land for the nation and where the various state, ombuds state ombudsman programs are located. And you'll see on the next slide. It's a very similar drop-down menu of a choice for you. If you have local ombudsman entities, you can choose all the ones that are applicable. You can choose, you know, however many AAAs have an ombudsman program, how many are in nonprofits. <laughs> Excuse me. And then there, if there's another location that you need to identify that doesn't quite fit nicely in those other options, then you can give that. Um, example of where those are. Once again, if you have no local ombudsman entities, there's a, a selection for that in the system. Next slide. So I'm assuming most of you are all very familiar. I'm not going to read this, but just a reminder of the definition of a representative of the office. And that is available in your NORS Table 3. You can see the definition there, but we've cited it also here from the code. And this is important to look back at the definition because the next part that we're going to talk about is counting the number of staff and volunteers. And all of these counts that we're referencing, we want you, to, it's a snapshot in time. And we want that date to be September the 30th of each year. Next slide. The requested uh, data for staff in the Office of the State Ombudsman and the local ombudsman entities, if you have them, is the same in OAPS as it was in, well, it's the same in OAPS. We're asking to report it very similarly. 
So you're going to report the number of employees that are designated as a representative of the office as a whole number, both full-time and part-time. And you're going to do the total count. We'll show you an example in just a, just a minute. But if you get, you know, tripped up or confused about how are we counting these, what is the FTE, once again, really encourage you to go back to type on uh, table three for the examples and also the new guide will help you answer some of those questions too. Next slide. So the requested data that we're asking for is both about the volunteers that are designated as representatives. We're asking for their hours that they donate. And then we're asking about all the other volunteers that are not designated as representatives. Next slide. So this is the example that I was referencing. So in this example, the office has three employees. They represent 2.5 full-time equivalents. So actually there are two employees that are working full time and there's one employee that works part time. So it shows up when you report it in the system as 2.5. In this example, there's um, zero state volunteer representatives, uh, zero hours donated by state volunteer representatives, and there is one person that is a, another type of volunteer but not a designated representative. Guess what? I'm going to get a much needed break now because I've got to go find a cough drop and I'm going to refer this over to Louise, who I'm very grateful for helping us with the presentation today. <clears throat> thank you, Louise. Yeah, thank you, Maria. So, um, you know, for those of you who've done NORS reports before, you're, you're familiar with having to report on organizational conflicts of interest. And of course, um, with the implementation of the Ombudsman Program Rule several years ago, uh, you've also learned about how to formally, you know, through a policy and procedure process, you know, identify, remedy, and remove organizational conflicts of interest. And then the requirement is to report them in accordance with the National Ombudsman Reporting System, or NORS. And now, the before you reported in the ORT, now you're going to report this, of course, into the OAPS. And as you know, this supports your kind of credibility of your program and uh, the effectiveness in showing that you can provide conflict-free complaint resolution is really important for the program. So what we'll do in the next few slides is just kind of compare and contrast how, um, how the reporting of conflicts of interest has changed and what's, what's now required. Um, and also a reminder that NORC, the NORC website has a lot of great tools if you are wanting to revisit um, identifying and remedying or removing organizational conflicts. And they have individual conflict of interest information too. Um, next slide. So with this new system, it means that we're starting from scratch. So even though you've reported in the past in the ORT and got those um, remedies and removals approved, um, this year you've got to start over. So every conflict, organizational conflict at the state and local levels uh, needs to be reported. Um, and with that report, as you identify the conflict, you will describe the remedy and you'll indicate, you know, if it's at the um, local, state level, or both. Um, and so uh, go ahead to the next slide. And I just really want to hammer away at this, so bear with me. So in the old ORT, you could have a paragraph, and that paragraph might have five conflicts, and then you had another paragraph with all the remedies right? But now in the OAPS, each conflict of interest you have to select from the drop-down menu. 
And then you have to, for each conflict, determine is it state, local, or both. And for each conflict, uh, provide that narrative description of the remedy or removal. Um, and so, you know, this is going to be some upfront work for all of you. Um, so next slide. And just, you know, so you know, even though you have to itemize each conflict, if the remedy is the same or very similar, you know, that's okay. You know, you may end up doing a lot of copying and pasting of your remedies. Um, and you can also go back to your previous ORT reports and use those um, when you describe your remedies and then review them to, you know, really look at, well, how many conflicts did I have uh, that we had to address? Next slide. So, um, uh, the other thing that you can do once you've done all this, right, once you've gotten through the first year, um, in future years, you'll be able to just roll over those conflicts because it, the conflicts still exist. Um, and so this way we're, we're doing a better accounting of the conflicts each year. So in future years, you can just roll them over, you know, review them. Um, maybe some remedies have changed. Um, you know, you may have new conflicts to add, um, et cetera. So, um, but, but that's why this year is like the heavy lift. And then in future years, it will be much easier. You know, I know in the old um, ORT, you could just say the conflicts have not changed. Um, and we accepted that. But that meant if I wanted to see what your conflicts were, I had to go back to 2016 and take a look. So this way, every year, we just keep that, that list going and we know without having to do a lot of digging. For those very few states that originally reported no conflicts of interest and that was approved by ACL, you know, you may be able to check that box. But again, you still need to do a real serious review and look. And, you know, ACL, we will be reviewing the conflicts of interest. You know, if we have questions, we'll be sending the report back with those questions. So, you know, just be aware. Um, and, you know, I will be doing some looking back uh, at what you previously reported. And if, say, in the past you had 10 conflicts and now you only report <clears throat> six, I'm going to wonder what happened. So, you know, um, be really thorough, look back at your ORT reports and, um, you know, make sure you cover all the bases. Next slide. Um, just some tips on the narratives. I think you've, uh, we've covered a lot of these. Um, again, you can <clears throat> bundle the same conflict. So if you have seven AAAs, that are providers of long-term services and supports, that's one conflict. So you don't have to keep picking it over and over. It's one conflict that applies to seven entities. And you can explain that in your narrative um, around your describing the remedy. Next slide. So I'm not going to read this, but I want to point out in this past description that there were two conflicts of interest and they're very similar. Um, this was a lot, this program's housed in a large umbrella agency that also has Department of Public Health that's responsible for licensing, surveying or surveying long-term care facilities. They also have staff that certify adult day health centers to participate in Medicaid. Um, next slide. So this is just the remedy there. We can go on to the next slide. And again, more of the remedy. So very detailed remedy here. Um, next slide. So, but I wanna point out when you submit something like this in the OAPS, you would be selecting two different conflicts. So licensed surveys or certifies long-term care facilities and licensed surveys or certifies long-term care services. 
So some of these look very similar, you know, certified services, certified facilities. Um, so you have to take a close look um, and make sure that you're selecting all of the conflicts. Next slide. And um, so here is another example um, where we have the remedy. Um, so I'm not going to read that. We can go on to the next slide. This would just be like the OAPS example. And it's basically pretty much the same remedy that was already in the old report. So again, you can, can certainly borrow from and copy from your past reports. Um, next slide. Okay, we're going to more of the remedy, so I'm gonna, we'll keep going. Okay, this is what I want to spend a little time on, and you may have questions. Uh, states have the hardest time, I think, reporting their funds expended. And um, it, it's, just, it's just tough. I'll just put it out there. For many reasons, it's hard to get the numbers on your funds expended. And sometimes that has really delayed your report when you have trouble getting that data and you end up putting in false numbers to get back to it later, it can really, you know, create problems. And this year it became doubly challenging because around the time we hoped to wrap up reports, COVID-19 hit and that just delayed getting a lot of reports finalized. Um, so, but just very quickly, you've got three distinct responsibilities with regards to fiscal management of the Ombudsman program. So the regulation, requires the ombudsman to determine the use of fiscal resources. You also are to report funds expended uh, data in accordance with NORS. And then you also review and certify that the program met minimum funding requirements. So those are three big buckets. And in the guidance, there's a little more detail on that. Next slide. So just quickly though, because I hear the term budget and expenditures interchanged a lot. So just to be clear, we don't want you to report your budget. That's your, you know, your budget is your estimation of revenue and expenses over a period of time, typically a year. Um, and then that budget is what you is used to kind of do your program planning and as the year year goes on, you're kind of looking at the budget and measuring, are we overspending, underspending, et cetera. But the expenditures in the federal term are charges made by a non-federal entity to a project or program for which a federal award was received. So that's a very technical term. A uh, simple way to put it is what money did you spend? Uh, and in, from what pot of money did you spend it? And that's what we want to know in NORS. Next slide. So here's an example um, of kind of putting together the budget and um, the funds expended. So um, you'll see on this that it's kind of got everything. It's showing the sources of uh, the sources of funds, how much was appropriated, how much was budgeted, how much was actually spent, and then this has the balance. So you'll see that shaded part is what you report in NORS. You report the totals. So in this example, we just have two um, budget lines, salary and fringe, and there would be a lot more in a budget, but we're just giving that for a simple example. And you'll see how the salary lines have different sources of funds associated with each, um, you know, with the funding, uh, with the budget. And then you can see how much money was spent. Um, so you can see that under salary, the budgeted amount was 149,000, but what was spent was 119,000. So, you'll uh, clearly that was underspent and same with fringe you can see it was budgeted at 44,700 but 40,000 was spent so it's that amount spent by the pot of money that you put 
in NORS. And so you can see the different pots of money, Title VII, Chapter Two Ombudsman, how much money was spent on salary, um, and down, down you go. So that is what we want, and there is confusion over that. Um, and I'm hoping that this kind of helps you give, get a visualization of what we want. Um, next slide. So in terms of preparing for funds expended, and I'd actually like to give you a homework assignment. Um, I think it'd be really helpful to your fiscal staff if you gave them that part F of table three and said, this is what I need that you give that to them in October and say, I need to report on this in January. I'm just giving you a reminder now. And then set an appointment to meet with your fiscal staff in November. And you may have to meet with several different people depending on if your program is contracted out, how many local entities you have, you know, who manages your uh, fiscal uh, you know, at your state office, at the state agency. So, you know, you might be making more than one appointment. But ideally, meet with them in November to say, you know, really talk about what you need. And by December to have a rough draft so that ideally by January, you can report on your funds expended. Next slide. Couple other tips that, you know, the uh, the guide that was developed gives a comprehensive list of the types of possible funds um, that you could use. And so that should be really helpful to you. Um, as always, we only want you to report on funds expended for the traditional long-term care ombudsman program authorized under section 712. So for instance, if your state has authorized and funded a home care ombudsman program, we do not want you to include those funds. Um, and we do not want you to report in-kind support, things like free supplies or free rent. Um, and finally, next slide. Um, you'll see here a very simple example of uh, funds expended. And this should look somewhat familiar to you um, from past reporting, if, if you've done a previous uh, NORS report. Um, the other thing I would say is that we, um, as you know, you got CARES Act funding, and your CARES Act is federal funds, and that would go under other federal. So it's not it's not Title Seven Chapter Two. It's other federal, um, and that is also explained further in the guide. So I've mentioned the the user guide several times now. Just want to emphasize how important it is to have that guide open as you work through this section of your Norris report. And with that, I will turn it back to Maria. Thank you, Louise. Um, we're going to jump right into part G, and I'm going to kind of swiftly go through all the slides so that we leave time for um, question and answers. But under Part G, you're going to be providing information about the facilities in your state. So it's going to be important for you to work in advance with your state's licensure and certification agency to get all of those lists of facilities by type and their definition. Next slide. Remember, these are facilities that you, that you, the State Ombudsman Program, have jurisdiction in that you would go into. So we suggest, once again, that you gather this total count as of September the 30th each year. Um, if the facilities are licensed or certified. And if you provide services on unlicensed facilities, you may list those also in your count. Um, we're going to ask that you give detailed information in OAPS about the types of residential care communities. And I think if you flip to the next slide, there's information if you're kind of unclear about the definition of residential care community, you can look back at through this uh, tip sheet that we provided through NORC. It's 
if you remember the old reporting system, it was called Board and Care. Now it's called Residential Care Community. And you can find additional information in those resources for helping you with that. The next slide just shows you a really simple example. In this um, hypothesis or fictional state, there are 150 nursing facilities and their resident capacity. That's like the number of beds that this facility is licensed for is 15,000. And then you see the residential care communities list there and the numbers. So next slide. So in this, you're going to be asked the type. So in this example, I listed personal care homes. And then in the type definition, you give a brief definition from your state's um, probably licensure or certification agency that describes the service that that type of, like this example, personal care home provides. Just really brief example. And then the next slide shows where you would list the capacity. So in your state, if this personal care home provides such and such services to a minimum of two people and up to a maximum of 25 people, it's how you would display it in the report. Next slide. I'm switching now to part H, which is your program activities. So once again, we keep referencing you back to all these great materials, but I think it would definitely answer your questions. Then also we've got the frequently asked questions that might be of help also. And then if you've exhausted those resources, you're still always welcome to call on us for advice or guidance. The next slide talks about the training hours, continuing education, and numbers of people completing the certification training. So this is for your training for representatives of the office. Um, when you report your certification hours, we're wanting to know what those number of hours are for someone to achieve certification, which would allow them to become designated. If you've got various training uh, levels based on whether or not the person's a volunteer or paid, Select the minimum number of training hours required to become a representative of the office. And then for uh, continuing education, report that annual number of hours of in-service required for your representatives. And if, once again, if you've got various levels of uh, continuing education requirements, we ask that you select the minimum number of continuing education hours to report uh, into the system. And as you're hearing often, September the 30th today is that magical date where you would count the total number of people who have completed the certification training within this prior federal fiscal year, which ends today, September the 30th. You do not count the people who went through the training but didn't complete the training. So if you know if you had somebody come in and they took you require 30 hours and they took 10 hours and they dropped out, then they don't count for the purposes of reporting into OAPS. Next slide. This references training for for uh, facility staff. So it's the in service. You're going to count it both for nursing facilities and residential care communities. So I want to focus on just a minute on the distance learning because probably more of you are doing that during the pandemic than in-person training for staff. So it is acceptable to report distance learning that you've done by webinars, conference calls, or on-demand courses. You've just got to have a way to ensure that the participants and completed the training, what their affiliation were, that sort of thing. So you've got to be able to count how many went through it. We're not asking, though, for the number of participants, but you need to have a way to be accountable for those that attended any of these distance learning opportunities. 
The distance learning training program tracks should track your completion numbers and the facility affiliation counts as, and it's going to be counted as one session. Okay, so even if 10 different people from one facility participated, it's going to be one facility affiliation count as one. Okay, next slide. Just to reiterate that uh, information and assistance is the work that you do that your representatives have done without opening a case and working to resolve a complaint. And you see the definition there on the screen. Next slide. So um, this is the facility visits. It's not really difficult if you just got to pay attention to what numbers are you reporting in. So we want to know the number of facilities that received at least one visit during the year, then to count all the visits to the facilities, and then the number of routine visits to each facility in all four quarters of the year. Got to also provide information about survey participation and resident and family council participation. I think those are pretty self-explanatory. If you go to the next page, there's an opportunity here, uh, in addition to, to, to giving the count for community education, for you to provide state and local level coordination activities. So there's a drop down box, you see the long list here, and you can choose all the various ones that you uh, actively worked on. And if for some reason there's not a, a listing of the work that you've done in the drop down box, you can share with us in a narrative form what that uh, type of coordination activity was. Next slide. It's a, just an easy example <laughs> of the number of visits. Remember, you're recording them by visits to a nursing facility and visits to the residential care communities. So it's a facility that received one or more visits, number of visits for all facilities, and the number of facilities that received routine access. For, more, for most states, it's monthly in a nursing home and quarterly in a RCC, but it might vary in your state. Next slide. Uh, there's that drop down box for all of the um, coordination activities. If you've done none, which I, I doubt very few people are going to choose this option, but if for some reason, there are no state and local level coordination activities, you're going to check off that box. Uh, but otherwise, you can check any of these that apply. If there's one that isn't um, listed that you want to discuss, you can include that under other. Next slide is an example. So when I mentioned other, uh, this example is explaining during COVID, the state ombudsman contacted the assisted technology program and worked with them on obtaining devices, devices that residents could use. So that is just a narrative there that you can refer back to in the guide if you wish. Next slide. Yeah. Speaking of COVID, um, there we've got a few slides on COVID information. If you'll move forward, Katie. We ask that in this year's uh, North submission, which is due in January, that one of the three complaint narratives somehow connect back to COVID and one of the three systems issues also discuss COVID-related work. And just a reminder, a couple of reminders, is that visits with residents through a window of the facility or outdoors on the grounds should be recorded as a facility visit. Next slide. But those visits with residents by phone or computer out do not count as a facility visit. Uh, make sure that you ask your representatives to document any COVID-related information pertinent in their cases. Um, share and review those with staff. And then we've got more resources available to you for the COVID. Uh, 19 pandemic issues that impact residents, and you can see those on the NORC site. Next slide. 
so I'm speaking on behalf of Louise and all the other good folks there at ACL. They understand that, you know, more than likely there are going to be much fewer facility visits this year, the school year, because in March is when the pandemic started and the visits were stopped. So I know that's going to impact your goals. Um, under the CARES Act expended funds, those are going to be recorded, as Louise mentioned a while ago when she went through the budget, they're going to be listed under other federal fund sources. Okay, next slide. Good. I hope that we've left some time for questions and answers and that you're ready to ask those, and I'm going to turn it over to Amity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria and Louise. I know everyone listening, that was a lot of information to cover all at once in one, one sitting during a webinar. Um, so we appreciate you sticking with us and we hope that you have some questions and I hope my audio is better. I'm sorry about the previous headset. So I'm looking through the chat and question box. Please submit any that you have. Um, I do see that there were a few questions that came in while either Louise or Maria were speaking and they were responded to privately. Um, so I do want to mention, uh, Louise, if it's okay, um, in response to one state that was asking about a vendor and working with a vendor, that Louise has made a note to herself to check in with all the vendors and, and basically see where they are in, in this process. And I know also that uh, the vendors have been reaching out and, and speaking and working with ACL over, over these past few months as well. Yeah. Um, sorry, go, go ahead. Uh, um, hi, Louise. I was just going to say just a couple things about the visits. Um, I would, I'm kind of anticipating this year that most programs are going to say they may not have had any routine access to report in terms of the number of facilities with routine access because you're reporting the number of facilities that had a vis at least one you know general visit in each quarter and because of covid we know that was pretty unlikely so it's really important that though all the other visits that you've done are entered into your software and that you are comfortable with, you know, extracting that and putting it in, into a template and uploading it um, into the OAP so that you get a real clear count of how many visits were done altogether, you know, and then how many, how many buildings, how many facilities actually got at least one visit. So we're still going to have some good visit information, but I'm going to be very surprised to see any that got routine access. So there might be a few, but it's going to be really dramatic. Um, so, um, and then Dale has a question to the panelists. How do we count resident council or care plan by Zoom? So resident councils, um, if you're having virtual resident council meetings, those would be um, counted as a resident council meeting. Um, NORS does not ask for care plan data. That's part of your complaint handling. So that would just be something that occurs within the complaint. Um, yeah, that's not something that, that we request. Thanks, Louise. And then we also did receive another question that was responded to in chat, I think, privately, but some of you may have the same question. Um, uh, Pierre was asking if OAPS pre-populates the federal appropriations for each state or if states have to enter that um, themselves. And Louise responded that um, state ombudsmen or the fiscal staff receive information on appropriation and it's always on the ACL website. And there's just as a reminder, no requirement to enter appropriations, only funds expended in OAPS for NORS. Good yeah, and just as a, Thank you. as a, and as a heads up, we're looking at, you know, a continuing resolution coming up this in fiscal 2021, starting tomorrow. So you're going to get dribbles of appropriation. So it, the word on the street is the continuing resolution will go to December 11th. So your programs will get your Title VII funds 
appropriated that uh, for that length of time. And of course, ACL Fiscal has to do their work to get the numbers together. So it'll be a few weeks before you actually get that information on how much is appropriated for this fiscal year. Um, okay, and I have an, a, another question. Please clarify the number of individuals who completed certification training. So when when you have, whether it's staff or volunteers who are coming on board and before they can do anything on behalf of the program, they have to go through training, typically called certification training, as part of becoming designated to represent the office. So the, the question is, how many people went to certification training? How many people completed it? If you uh, had 30 people throughout the year show up for certification training, but only 25 completed it, then you would report 25. So it's just the number of people who completed the training. They may not have become designated. We're not asking how many people were designated in the year. We just, we're just trying to get a sense of how many people did you train for purposes of designation. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Um, and this is actually in our frequently asked questions in the guide. So uh, Sally asked if we could confirm that we count the number of representatives of the office effective on September 30. I uh, had an ombudsman retire on September 25th. So do I exclude him from the count? Um, so yes. Um, we are taking a snapshot, and the snapshot is September 30th. So if somebody truly retired on September 25th, um, you would not count them in the count of FTEs um, or people working on the program. However, all of their activities, complaint work, et cetera, of course, would be counted. Um, but it just is one of those things. It's, you know, we're picking a day. It's the last day of the federal fiscal year. Um, so that's, that's how that works. So that person would not be counted. Thanks, Louise. And we also had a couple questions come in on the chat. Can we count Facebook live sessions with residents and family members? And I assume, um, you're talking about maybe counting them as council meetings or what would you want to count them as Maraid? what would your you can send that in the chat um and then in the meantime louise any way that those could be counted yeah i mean that could be community education you know if it's not a specific resident council or family council meeting that sounds like that fair game to call it community education, if you're in, interacting and engaging with, you just didn't post something on Facebook, you had an engagement, a dialogue. Um, so that I, I, is, I think it's fair if, if it doesn't make sense to call it a resident or family council meeting, it would, um, it would be um, considered community education. Um, I agree. And just to further clarify, so it's, um, and this is hinted on in, in some of the training materials already, but so for COVID specific, um, the difference is it's live engagement, you're providing information and assistance and, and, you know, directly to people that are listening to you and asking questions, opposed to posting maybe a webinar recording on your public Facebook page and encourage, encouraging people to watch it. So that's, again, the difference and being able to count it as community education. And I think that would be a good one for us to add to our North FAQ. So I'm taking that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead, or did you want me to read the next question? Um, go ahead and read difference. it. And I can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, explain the difference between a COVID complaint versus a complaint that is complicated by COVID. I think most of our complaints are compli complicated by COVID, but not specifically a COVID complaint. Um, I, I would say we're not going to, you know, we're not going to distinguish there. Uh, you know, COVID is complicating everything. And so, you know, um, 
you know, if the resident was, say, abruptly transferred for purposes of cohorting and they're upset about it and they lodge a complaint and want the program to do something about it, it's caused by COVID. Uh, you know, it's it's related to COVID. So it's really hard to, to sort that out. It's more about, you know, might there be a really good example that you want to submit for your narrative? We're with the new OAPs, I'll be able to look at complaints um, by month and what the trends are and how they change month to month. So it's really, I think, going to, we're going to get some clues as to the issues that COVID caused, um, you know, just by looking at the complaint trends over time. So, I, yeah, I wouldn't get too um, concerned about, you know, is it COVID related or caused by COVID? Um, yeah. So, right. yeah. So another question and Claudette, I hope I'm understanding this correctly, but what if we only require a number of in-service trainings and not, it says in hours, I'm assuming in-service hours for continuing education. So are you saying that you require a certain number of in-service like sessions or instances of training, but not hours for continuing education. So I hope I'm understanding that correctly. And if so, and Louise, of course, speak to this as well. Um, but as we mentioned a few slides back, states must report the annual number of hours of in-service hours that would count as continuing education. So that may you may need to revisit how you count your continuing education if you don't currently count it as hours and you count it as sessions. Does that make sense and answer your question? And Louise, feel free to add in if I missed something. Yeah, so, you know, it looks like Claude, Claudette said, yes, we don't count it in hours. Right. So I think, yeah, you're going to have to look at uh, reframing that and if this year you don't know, if you can put zero. I mean, if you really don't don't have a standard, that's okay. We want to get a baseline this year of where you're at. And if you just don't have a standard right now, you can put zero. Um, with the training standards coming into uh, coming into uh, where we want you to be in compliance with the training standards by fiscal year, let's see, by the end of fiscal year 2021. So by September 30, 2021, we want to see you all, you know, achieving the, getting to the training standards. We would look for the following year that you would, you know, be able to, with uh, confidence, report 18 hours for continuing education at a minimum. So, and there will be more uh, discussion later about the training standards, but um, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so I don't believe we missed, I just double checked the Q&A box. I don't think we missed questions there and I believe we answered all of those in the chat. So we just have a couple minutes left. So Katie, if we can go to the next slide, I wanna go through the resources and just remind you on, on how to contact us. So uh, next slide, please. This slide, we compiled all of the links for all the main North and OF web pages and key resources. Some are on the private side, some are on the public side, depending on what the content is. Um, but just please remember that we have some general NORS FAQs, as well as some FAQs specific to documenting program activities during COVID. So, um, as we said in some of the uh, training slides, please refer to NORS Table 3, the new guide, and the FAQs. And then if those don't answer your questions, it may be answered in the basic training materials for NORS. Um, just please access those resources. And then if you cannot find the answer still, then reach out to us and we'd be happy to respond. Next slide. So in summary, we heard from Louise, thank you again, Louise, about ACL's perspective regarding NORS and OS reporting. We heard a little bit about data management. We reviewed the new Table 3 user guide, provided a few um, points about COVID and documenting activities during the pandemic, and 
had some time for Q&A and reviewing our resources. As I mentioned earlier, the slides and recording from today's webinar will be on the website and we'll make sure to send out the link uh, once they're posted. You have our contact information on the next slide. Again, feel free to reach out to us about programmatic questions regarding NORS and OAP. And then refer, of course, to the help desk for technical questions regarding the OAP system. So last but not least, I want to, of course, give a huge thank you to Maria, who was the consultant on this project, and it was a really big lift, and we appreciate everything you did for it. Thank you, Louise, for all of your support and technical assistance and helping us make these resources um, as, uh, as effective and as possible. So I hope you find them all helpful and you know where we are, so please ask questions and take some time, like we said, to play in OAPS right now. And then we will have another session about NORS and OAPS in October. Um, and so be ready for that with your questions and we'll send more information about that when we have it. So thank you all for joining us today. Any last comments, Louise or Maria, before we close out? I just wanna you know, again thank uh, Amity and Maria and Katie also for moving the slides through and helping us with technology. Um, yeah, I hope you found this session helpful. And as always, we're um, ready to support you and also just, you know, use the tools um, that are available to you. But of course, we are always, always happy to answer questions. And I'm really looking forward to getting your reports. I can't tell you how nerdy it sounds and how excited I am to see your reports. So uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks, it was a great thank team you all. Effort. Yeah, thank and you thank all. you, Katie. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.